Church. We're so glad you're with us, especially in person. And the Grace Notes Handbell Choir is with us too. Thank you. Grace Notes. <laughs> um, if you're watching us online, we welcome you as well. My name is Laura Cruz and I'm your liturgist today. And the Reverend Dr. Page message this morning is sending witnesses. For our visitors, there's some information cards if you'd fill them out and put them in the baskets as you leave, and that's also the place for your offerings. There are some Bible study opportunities on every Sunday morning at 8.30 in the Clark Building or at 9 a.m. in the library. Either one is fabulous, and you should make an effort to attend. Presbyterian women will meet today. Uh, we'll meet in Fellowship Hall, most likely, and they also have a quilt. It's a beautiful handmade quilt available for uh, auction, and I understand that sometime in the middle of May, I think the 18th, we're going to have a uh, ham dinner. Remember that everything Presbyterian women receives goes directly to charities. They pay for all their materials and food along the way, so it's just everything you give goes directly to charities. And the Finance and Stewardship Committee meeting will meet tomorrow, Monday evening. The Altar Church, is it still in need of plastic bags, egg cartons, and non-perishable food items? There's a basket in Fellowship Hall for that. We need volunteers for the sound booth. We really need some volunteers to cover some of our vacation times. So please see Al Cruz or Bill Fry uh, for you can get trained and do the sound booth for us. And we still need additional greeters. So please see me if you're willing to be a greeter for one or two Sundays. Let's now quiet our hearts and our phones and worship the Lord.
call to worship. When fear and doubts stroll through our doors, God stands beside us, whispering peace. When we toss and turn late at night, God sits by our beds, singing lullabies of love. When we stumble through the shadows of sin, God illuminates the path of goodness and joy. Please stand if you're able and join us while we sing Your Servants of God, Your Master Proclaims. call to confession. If our actions mirrored our words, if our hands were mentored by our hearts, if we walked the talk, we would be God's children. But too often it is our silence, our doubts, our fears which tell others who we truly are. Let us confess to God how we have not been as faithful as we hope, as we pray, saying together, God of empty tombs, Peter speaks with power and clarity of his faith. While we remain silent, the psalmist speaks of trust in you. While our doubts overwhelm us, Jesus is ready to come and grace us with peace. But our fears keep our hearts shuttered and locked. God of all hearts, your love can change us from scared people to children of grace. You can weed doubts from our hearts and plant seeds of joy in their place. You can silence the panic of our souls with the peace Jesus offers to each of us. Transform us into Easter people through the power of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Please take a moment of silent confession. assurance of pardon. What marvelous love, what wondrous grace, what abundant mercy God offers to us. We are God's people. That is exactly who we are. We, we are, are God's, God's children, children, those whose lives have been changed by the one who loves us and forgives us. Thanks be to God. Amen. In sharing the passing of the peace with, of Christ, we express the reconciliation, unity, and love that comes only from God, and we open ourselves to the power of God's love to heal our brokenness, 
and make us agents of that love in the world. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Amen. Amen. Please take a moment to greet each other. Please rise as we continue to sing to the Lord, I, the Lord of sea and sky.
to support the ministry of this church with their gifts, tithes, and offerings, both in person and online. And I would remind you, as Laura said at the beginning, there are baskets at the doors of the sanctuary. If you're here and want to make a contribution to the work and ministry of the church today, the baskets will receive your offering at the end of the service if you've not already made it. There are ways for those who join us online to contribute to the work of the church, but I don't know what they are. But Laura does. Well, I, you're right, I do. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, you can send a check in to us. That would be wonderful. You, you can drop it in the mailbox on Indiana. That works, too. Uh, we also receive payments via Zelle. Uh, which most people's bank handles. So just let us know clearly who it's from in the Zell accounts. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give thanks to God that we have enough and to share. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we do thank you that you see to our needs so that we can support the work and ministry of this wonderful congregation of the mission we share in Central Florida Presbytery and far beyond around the world through our gifts. We may not think when we write a check or put some money in the plate how far it goes, but by your grace and in your hands and the hands of your faithful servants, it is blessed to be a blessing. Thank you for letting us be part of that. Bless the gifts that are given this day that they may do the work you have for them to do. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. We come to the pastoral prayer and our sharing in the Lord's Prayer together. I wonder before we pray what joys and concerns you have to share today. Chris? Thank you. Yes, Arlene? Well, I know her home congregation is proud of her, however she does. Thank you. Yes. Yes.
arrangements are being made without your participation. <laughs> Got it. I have a prayer request that came in to the um, office to share with you. Louise Steyer asked for prayers for her nephew, Mark Johns. Mark is, a, Mark is U.S. Army retired, and he came to visit the stairs when he suddenly became ill, and he is now hospitalized. So, yeah, you all, some of you might want to check in with Louise to see what support they need and how Mark is doing. In the week ahead, are there others? Yes. Yes, John, uh, Tom, sorry. I want to apologize to the congregation. I was here last week and my alarm button went off and I can't have you mad if someone came to the back. So I apologize. Well, I'm friends with John and Sally and I, I certainly enjoy the congregation. John, we're glad you're a part of this congregation. I don't think that you need to apologize, though I bet the congregation accepts it graciously. And I was thrilled that you, that you woke up in time for the sermon. <laughs> yes. Oh, how wonderful. Congratulations. Wendy. Great, we will do it, thank you. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we are grateful that you call us to life not alone but in community together, where joys and concerns can be shared. We're thankful for the beauty of this spring season, for the flowers that bloom, the sandhill cranes that produce yet another generation and clog the roads. Most especially, we thank you for your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came that we might know life and joy and abundance, not just today, but forever by your grace. We're grateful that you want to know our joys You've heard the concerns that, we, you've heard the celebrations of surgery that went well, of 70 years of married life to be celebrated by a loving family, of, of though John in his comments apologized, we are grateful to know that the medical professionals respond quickly when they are alerted and help our community know that we can rest assured that by your grace there are others who care for us. We pray your healing mercy on those recovering from surgery, on those grieving a family death, We pray for traveling mercies for those on the roads this week, whether to Vermont or home here from somewhere else, and all of the reasons that people have to travel. We pray for those whose illness is so serious and they know not perhaps what it is, like Chris's coworker. We pray for Andrew as he makes changes. We pray with joy for the coming of a great grandchild. Lord, we pray not only for ourselves and those we know and love, but also for those known to and loved by you for whom no one else prays this day. That the hungry may be fed, 
the homeless find safe shelter, the thirsty something pure to drink that sustains life. We pray that all those who mourn may be comforted in the assurance of your love, which even death cannot stop. And for the promise that we will be reunited with those we've loved and lost before the throne of grace. Our hearts are troubled by news of war. Especially we pray this day for the people of Israel and Palestine as the Iranians have joined in the fighting there with their own threats. Because we know that peace is a fragile thing. And it's a thing that belongs to you. And we pray that you will hasten the day when the world you love and created may know the peace you long for for it. Grant that leaders in every place may come to understand that we share this planet together, that their job is to be good stewards of the work you call them to do on behalf of the people they lead. As leaders of cities and counties and states and nations, as leaders in schools, in businesses, and in congregations. We pray especially for the work of your church that we may be here and everywhere faithful witnesses of your love and of your grace, that those whose lives touch ours now, even before it comes upon the whole world together through our lives, may know something of your peace and love. All this we pray in the name of Christ who taught us when we pray to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, isn't it a treat to have the handbells here today? I'm so glad I got to be here. I understand that you all will be at First Kissimmee next week, and Frank Allen, who was a long, long time, oh, at Hope, and Frank Allen, who worships there, will be back here. So, poor Frank. <laughs> Last week, I read to the congregation who were here from John's Gospel, the story of Easter night. In John's Gospel, that story I think pays maybe too much attention, I said last week, I think maybe pays too much attention to Thomas and he gets a bad rap because Thomas wasn't there in John's gospel. And, and when the others tell him that Jesus is, they've seen the Lord, he says, yeah, well, I won't believe it till I see his hands in his side. It's a familiar story. But after he dies, Thomas goes all the way to India to share the gospel. There still are people in India who call themselves Thomas Christians, tracing their faith all the way back to that first century witness who went farther than any other. So, yeah, I think he got a bad rap, and that's all I want to say about that. Today, we have the story of the same Easter night as Luke tells it. And so with that background, listen to the gospel from the 24th chapter of Luke's gospel, beginning to read at the 36th verse. I should say to you before I start to read that what they are talking about is the testimony of the two that Jesus meets on the road to Emmaus who know who he is when he breaks bread at table with them. They've run back to Jerusalem to share that news. While the disciples were talking about this, the Emmaus disciples coming back, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and at my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see that a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of the Lord. Amen. A different story, huh? Different telling of the same story, but isn't that what witnesses do? You know, how many times I have heard many times that different people will see an accident in the street or something happen in an office or a classroom and when they're asked to describe it you get different stories from different people that's what we have here different telling of the story from the perspective of different witnesses so the two disciples hurry back from Jerusalem to Jerusalem and they tell their companions what happened in Emmaus. And then the disciples encounter Jesus just as the two on the road did. And just like the two on the road, they don't understand what's happening. They, they seem to connect this one who is standing in their midst 
with their crucified teacher, but they think he's a ghost. They're confused, they're full of doubt, and Jesus then explains to them what's happening, offering them his body, showing them his wounds. Next, as he did at the table at Emmaus, he eats with them. After all, ghosts don't eat. As he did with the two on the road, he continues his explanation by opening to them the scriptures to show that everything they have learned and taught before his crucifixion leads them to this moment. I think he must especially have been referring to the suffering servant portion of Isaiah, but there's also Joel and others who talk about what will happen when the Messiah comes. Luke doesn't mention here if all the disciples finally believe or were enlightened. And in actual fact, if we flip over to the first chapter of Luke's second book, the book of Acts, we know that after 40 days with Jesus, after the resurrection, and he's teaching them about the kingdom of heaven, the question they ask is, okay, so now are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? I mean, these guys are clueless until the Spirit comes to them, and unlike what happens in John's Gospel, the Spirit does not come upon them in Luke's telling of the story until Pentecost. Luke makes a real separation between what happened in that room at the end of the first day of the week and what's to happen in the upper room 50 days later. The Spirit will come, but on this night, on Easter night, the disciples are given the content of the message that they are to share with the world. They are to tell about repentance and forgiveness that comes in Jesus' name. Today's reading ends with their commissioning. Luke begins to paint the picture of what it looks like when the disciples fulfill their calling as witnesses. As the story picks up in Acts, after the giving of the Spirit, they're all able to communicate with people in all of the languages of people gathered in Jerusalem so that everybody can hear them in the language of their heart. And then Peter tells the Jerusalem, preaches a sermon in which he tells all of those people and the leaders in Jerusalem who are wondering what in the world. He tells them what God has done and is doing in Jesus. And the church begins. In this upper room story, we are able to enter, identify, with the story, if we're honest with ourselves, we come with our doubts, with our questions, with our confusions and fears and misunderstanding. I know I am not the only person in the room for whom that's true, right? If I were, if I were preaching at Washington Shores, I now would say, can I get an amen? <laughs> Every week, though, through worship, we encounter the risen Christ. In the reading of scripture and the preaching of the word, we are offered explanation, proclaiming the good news of what God has done and is doing. We eat with Christ. The table is off to the side because we have the bells, but we eat with Christ, the resurrection meal. The Spirit brings enlightenment. It opens hearts and minds. It sets our hearts afire. But we don't stay here in the sanctuary. We are sent out as witnesses. We exit the sanctuary just as the disciples exited that upper room, just as Jesus exited after his encounters with them. Christ has sent us to the entire world to be witnesses to the amazing good news that God loves this world and that he wants people everywhere to find hope and purpose beyond doubt, 
fear, confusion, and misunderstanding. To repent from narrow self-interest and to turn to God's purpose for us and for the world because God forgives sin and longs for right relationship, which is what repentance, turning from sin and turning toward God provides. I was talking yesterday after a funeral with a preacher friend, a friend of both of us had died and we were there, talking with my preacher friend about his work at the church he serves. He's been there now for several years And he said to me that he's learned two things that keep him focused in ministry. And I think those two things are key to keep us, all of us, focused as Christ's witnesses. The first is that God's got this, whatever this is. We may not be able to see this, but we can affirm that God is working. God's got this, whatever it is. The second is, it's not about me. I don't witness to my own belief, understanding, whatever. I witness to the love and power of God to forgive. I do that by offering God's forgiveness, which, John, I should have done to you, to say it's not just about the congregation's forgiveness. God forgives you when you bump and and all of us, when we bump and do things that by accident, or on purpose even, that we don't mean to do, especially when we get up and say, I apologize. So what does it take for ordinary people to be Christ's witnesses? And remember, the first witnesses for sure were ordinary people. It takes being in worship together. It takes studying scripture together to discover what the Bible has to tell us about God's purposes and Christ's ministry of healing, feeding, calling to life together in community, and his self-sacrifice for our sakes that calls on us to sacrifice self-centeredness and to embrace life that sees others as loved by God just the way we are. That's a perspective we can't get unless we have the support of a community in worship, prayer, and study together. Beyond our life together in the church, we're connected to people all around us. Many Central Florida community leaders, including the mayors of Orlando and Orange County, Joel Hunter, retired pastor from Northland Church, and a couple hundred more have signed what is called the Central Florida Pledge. The pledge says, I will lead by example, treating all people, especially those with whom I disagree, with kindness and respect. I will refrain from inflammatory words and actions and actively support those being attacked. I will report threatening incidences of hate and violence to the police tips line. I will educate myself about anti-Semitism, homophobia, racism, Islamophobia, and all other forms of discrimination and help others in my circle of influence to do the same. That's a tall order, but yet in the world torn by conflict as ours is, it seemed that, that the Central Florida Pledge seems perhaps to be a step in the right direction, calling people in community together to commit to these things. Scott Maxwell, who is an elder at Maitland Presbyterian Church and a journalist with the Orlando Sentinel, says this about why he signed. Because I believe hatred and bigotry against any group is wrong, and we all should stand against it. This is a diverse and welcoming community, and we, should let the world know. That may seem like a strange thing to talk about in a sermon. And it may be that for some people hearing me here, some people in our larger community, a commitment to all of those things is not something they can do. And that's okay. 
This is a voluntary thing that people are asked to sign if they want to be a part of it. And in a world where wars and hatred is much too common on the basis of faith, on the basis of race, I believe that now as much as ever, we are called to be witnesses of Christ's redeeming love and to join with others who work to see that it comes to pass. Maybe having politicians, police, educators, faith leaders, and ordinary folks like us pledge ourselves to standing with the oppressed like Jesus did is one sign of the kingdom of God breaking in in the midst of chaos. Thanks be to God. May it be so. Amen. I invite you now to stand in body or in spirit and join with us as we affirm our faith together in the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
please stand to receive I'm sorry, please stand to receive the benediction. Remembering that you are God's witnesses. Go to live so that those whose lives touch yours know something of God's love. And grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I did. <laughs>